I must admit that I really struggle with today's gospel reading. I find it confusing and troubling. The Jesus I know as loving and compassionate and all-inclusive seems caught in a moment, maybe a very human moment, that has taken him out of character. Or so it seems, anyway. Hasn't Jesus always preached unlimited and unconditional love and acceptance for all people? Hasn't he always sided with those on the edges, those on the margins, the, the least among us? Didn't he say that the least would indeed be first? Hasn't he frowned upon those who offer preferential treatment to the elite while setting aside the needs of the less fortunate? But today, as the Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile, throws herself at his feet begging him to save her daughter, Jesus instead offers sharp-edged words that cut deep. Let the children be first, meaning the children of his own Jewish class, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Where's the compassion? What about always bringing people into community? His behavior seems inconsistent with his teaching. It's unlike him to draw a dividing line between the have and the have-nots, the gets and the get-nots. It's incongruent with how he lives his life and how he teaches us to live ours. <clears throat> Good spiritual reflection is richest with intention, and surely there is tension in this text. Good spiritual reflection is always more about asking the right questions than having all the right answers. <clears throat> and the questions in this text seem particularly compelling. <clears throat> How does it feel for us to see our teacher of compassion act with such indifference toward the suffering? How does it feel for us to hear such sharp, uncaring words come from our teacher of compassion and love? What is Jesus teaching us in this moment? <clears throat> I spend a lot of time with people living on the margins, out of the mainstream, tucked away and from sight in the L.A. County jails. We spend time together. We share the struggle of life and joy of life together. So even though I feel that I'm a brother to the entire world, it's different with the incarcerated community. We've been through a lot together over the years. It feels like family. These so-called dogs are my chosen people. So when Jesus diminishes those who are close to me, it feels personal. And then I hear his words ringing within me. Just as you did it for the least of these who are my family, you did it for me. And, just as you refuse to do it to the least of these who are my family, you refuse to do it to me. Wait a minute. It's personal for him, too. Maybe it's the most personal for him. Further, it's personal between him and me and you and the Syrophoenician woman. Maybe Jesus knows the best way to teach us a lesson about the danger of classism, elitism, and hypocrisy is to model it in real time from the one from whom we least expect it. Maybe the very fact that this text is so deeply bothersome means that Jesus has me right where he wants me. And just when I feel the sting... Guess what happens? He changes his mind. He shows compassion. It seems that the woman's persistence has paid off. It changed his view. It feels like she has reminded him that mercy and justice for all people 
is more important than social convention. There has been a lot more attention drawn to an unjust criminal system in this country in the past year than there has been in recent history. Media attention and commitment to the illuminating the truth about the atrocities and failures of the criminal justice system in the United States are at a recent all-time high. It seems that every week, major news media carry yet another story, another front page story, that sheds light on a very dark system of human degradation. Issues of mass incarceration, solitary confinement, policing policies, racism, the warehousing of our mentally ill and drug addicted in jails and prisons, the horrible way we treat our youth offenders. The victims of crime also cannot be lost in this conversation. The criminal justice system does little, if anything, to help those who have been so unfairly wounded by the actions of others. They are all too often left adrift with nowhere to turn. From where is their help to come? Restorative justice, by its very nature, needs to include working hard on both sides in order to bring about reconciliation. This afternoon, after we leave here, as it is every Sunday during the prayers of the people at Eucharist in the jail, we will pause and pray with the inmates for their victims. It's always a moment of truth. Also, each program year during National Victims Awareness Week, we include right here in this church a special Taze service dedicated to victims of crime. That service will be held on the evening of Friday, April 1st at 7.30 p.m. And I hope everybody in this church today will join us in prayer. Much is happening to bring restorative justice issues to the forefront, and change is happening as a result. Just this past week, it was announced that California will move 2,000 inmates out of solitary confinement, some of whom have been kept in isolation without significant human contact for over three decades. Thirty years isolated. Politicians on both sides of the aisle have acknowledged that reform is needed in this country. Right here in Pasadena, the Ninth District Court of Appeals is hearing arguments regarding, regarding the unconstitutionality of the death penalty, and the decision that that court makes right here in Pasadena will have a ripple effect across the country. President Barack Obama is putting an exclamation point on his recent call for criminal justice reform and restorative justice measures by becoming the first sitting president ever to visit a federal prison when he visited El Reno Correctional Facility in El Reno, Oklahoma this, this past summer. The publication of two important books have had enormous impact on the American public's awareness of the criminal justice system in America and the need for restorative justice measures. A book titled The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander casts light on the truth behind the so-called war on drugs and exposes it for what it really is, a justification to herd millions of people of color and poverty into mass incarceration. More, more recently, Brian Stevenson's book titled Just Mercy which tells the real, true life stories of people whose lives have been destroyed by a very broken and corrupt criminal justice system is taking this nation by storm. You can find it on Amazon and in every bookstore in the nation. And now, it was just announced a couple weeks ago, that Starbucks will be carrying that book in every one of their stores across the entire country. It's an important piece of work, and I hope that you will all take the time to read it. So what does all of this talk about equality and justice and mercy have to do with today's gospel reading? Well, 
everything, really. Because the Syrophoenician woman is, was seeking healing, mercy, and justice. Like other women in the New Testament, women like the persistent widow and the hemorrhaging woman who dared to push through the crowd, reach out and take what they needed from God, the woman in today's story would not settle for anything less than what she needed and deserved. They are like Mary herself, who proclaimed her Magnificat song to God. The mighty arm of God scatters the proud in their conceit, pulls tyrants from their thrones, and raises up the humble. The Lord fills the starving and lets the rich go hungry. God rescues lowly Israel, recalling the promise of mercy the promise made to our ancestors, to Abraham's heirs forever. We are those heirs. So if you are bothered by the words that refer to people as dogs today, you should be. If you're insulted, you should be. If you are bothered by a call to social justice, you should ask yourself why you're bothered by that. Because we should be bothered by anything that diminishes the human spirit and for that matter, any of God's creation, no matter who the words are coming from, even and especially when they come from Jesus. We should be troubled enough in our spirit to insist on change, insist on justice, insist on mercy for all. The big question is what are we going to do about it? In our baptismal covenant, we made an agreement with God to seek and serve Christ and all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves, to strive for justice and peace among all people, and respect the dignity of every human being. All persons, all people, every human being, period. This is the agreement we have with God. And we should not rest until those are absolute truths. There's a new consciousness growing in this country around social justice, but we still have a long way to go. We also have, I believe, an obligation as Christians to lead the way. Because if that is what Jesus wants, it has to be what we want. If we're going to call ourselves Christians and followers of the way of Jesus, the time is right. We have a unique opportunity to seize this moment and help bring about God's reign of mercy and justice. The only question that remains is will we do it? 